Hi guys and welcome back to another true crime and make time video. Today's case was requested by a lot of you guys. I will leave your screen names up on the screen and a lot of you guys in general were requesting to talk about more honor killing cases to bring awareness to more cases and you guys know how I feel about this topic and the case of Banaz Mahmud is another horrific sad case imagine at just the age of 17 being forced into marriage you are brutally abused and violated in this marriage you try to leave and it's your own family that begins plotting your painful death this is the story of Banaz Mahmoud. So hopefully I don't butcher a lot of the names and the pronunciations, but I did Google a lot of them. So I'm going to try and like pronounce them as best as I can. Banaz was born on 16th December 1985 and her family was originally Kurdish. They were from Iraq and they moved to the UK from Iraq when Banaz was 10 years old. They did this in 1995 and Banaz moved along with her whole family, her parents, Mahmoud Babakir Mahmoud and Beya Mahmoud. And she had four sisters and a brother, as well as a lot of extended family members that joined them. Her father, Mahmoud, was a former soldier and he was fleeing Saddam Hussein and he moved his family to the UK to seek asylum. And once they were granted asylum, they moved to Mitcham in South London. Banaz is the main, I guess, topic of this case. But remember, she also had four sisters and a brother. The eldest daughter's name was Bekol. And then Banaz was born and then her sister Payman. So Banaz was 10 when she moved to the UK. And then that means Bekol was 12. And then Payman was nine. According to Bekol, they were brought up in a violent patriarchal family where women and girls were subjected to oppressive rules. Bekol remembers her first beating happened when she was around six because she touched a male relative's fingers. Her father, together with their mom's help made their daughter follow and abide by strict rules. They couldn't pet a dog, wear makeup, look at men in public, wear nail polish, do their eyebrows, shave their legs. If they attempted to do any of these things, they would get beat. They would call their daughters whores if they disobeyed them. And Becole believes all of this stems from a desire to control. The family and community's honor is more important than anything else. How they are perceived in the community, how the family is looked at, thought about, spoken about. If a particular family's daughter misbehaved, you know, she would be talked about and called a whore because, you know, if she is wearing nail polish, then obviously she's trying to attract men. Hence, she wants to sleep with these men. Hence, she can't be controlled and you as the family need to control them. Otherwise, your reputation is ruined. So basically a girl's or woman's sexuality is controlled and from what I gather it kind of just all boils down to sexuality because yes you know a woman's behavior should also be controlled but what does it boil down to in the end it's the woman can't be ruined sexually and one way to control a woman is through female genetic mutilation if you don't know what that is it involves the partial or <sighs> total removal of a female's external genitalia or it could also be performing an injury to the female's genitalia for no medical reason. There are actually many different ways this is done and I will leave a link below for those of you that want to read in detail about how bad it truly is but basically now this practice has no health benefits okay for girls or women but it can cause severe bleeding and problems urinating and later cyst infections as well as complications during childbirth and increased risk of newborn deaths. More than 200 million girls and women alive today have undergone female genital mutilation in 30 countries in Africa, the Middle East and Asia where it is normally practiced. Now this horrific 
act is performed on these young girls and these women because it's a way to control their sexuality. Now, people, some people believe that if you don't do this, when the girl is young or, you know, when she's a young woman, then her sexual appetite becomes impossible to control, impossible to satisfy, you know, that they will just be raging horn bags apparently. But for some reason, it's thought that it ensures virginity before marriage and fidelity, staying faithful in the relationship afterwards. And also to increase male pleasure, which I was like, how? But this is just what people believe. So, Nicole, at the age of only eight, she was taken one day by her grandmother, who had vision problems, by the way, but her grandmother took her because she wanted to perform the procedure on Bikol. Paimon and Banaz were also subjected to this cruelty but their procedure was performed by a woman in the community who was known for doing these procedures. During Bicol's procedure, keep in mind there was no pain relief or anesthesia. During Bicol's procedure, keep in mind she had no pain relief, no anesthesia, no nothing. And during the act, her grandmother cut into a nerve. And to fix this mistake, she threw hot oil on her genitals to seal the cut. I mean, that's not sealing the cut, that's cooking them. All three girls didn't have uh, anesthesia, none of them. I mean, I'm pretty sure majority of the poor girls that go through this don't have any anesthesia or pain relief. And Bekol believes that her grandmother did this on purpose because Bekol was a little bit rebellious growing up. Keep in mind, there are adults all around them and no one says anything. And, you know, me having a daughter, this broke my heart. What I don't understand is that the women who are performing these procedures, is it just that they have this cultural belief? Are they scared of the other men or are they just brainwashed into believing that this is the right way? that women have to suffer under the guise of tradition and belief. I mean, I'm sure they too went through this torture. Don't they remember how they felt? It's just wild as a, as a society how these things can carry on. Nicole claims that her father could be kind at times, but her mother would be violent along with him. Now, a lot of people would think once you move to a Western country, you know, these kinds of traditions and beliefs would end. And I'm talking about the bad stuff. You know, positive traditions and cultures are beautiful, but the family had strong views on the role of women. And when they moved to the UK, they were not happy with their daughters being exposed to the Western culture, music and fashion. But Cole was fascinated by the little things like earrings and a bottle of Coke and nail polish. And this just caused her parents to become stricter. Bacol ran away from her community and her family at the age of just 19. And she did this because she refused to enter into an arranged marriage with one of her cousins. Bacol said she would be subjected to physical abuse because she would experiment with Western clothing and hang with people that her parents just didn't approve of. Bacol believes that if she stayed with her family, especially after rejecting this arranged marriage proposal, she would be killed. And she wasn't just imagining this, okay? Her father had paid her brother to kill her. One day, her brother struck her over the head with a dumbbell, but he couldn't go through with it. He couldn't kill her. She went to the police. She reported being stalked and that an attempt was even made to kill her, but nothing was done about it. Her father even threatened to kill himself, his wife, and his daughters if Bicol didn't return home. However, Bicol never returned and initially she lived in foster care before moving on to a women's shelter and to this day she's still living under witness protection. After Bicol escaped her father's inability to control Bicol was seen as a weakness within the Kurdish community and he was rejected for a while. Paimon was Benazi's younger sister and she 
described her relationship with Banaz as being extremely close. They were only 15 months apart and Banaz was always there for Peman no matter what. Peman was bossy and outspoken and Banaz was actually very sweet and very compromising and always wanted to put a smile on other people's faces. To reclaim some of the family honor after Bekol's refusal to marry the person that her father saw fit at the age of just 16 and 17, he arranged for the marriages of his two daughters, Peiman and Banaz. Both of them were forced to enter into marriages with much older men. Peiman was known as Paisy, so she was forced to enter into a marriage with a man that was 15 years older than her, and then Banaz's husband was 10 years older than her. Both of these men were from their hometown in Kaladiza, and at one point, all four of them lived together. Banaz claimed that her husband was uneducated and old-fashioned. She didn't like the fact that he didn't speak English and that his thinking was that of someone from 50 years ago. In this marriage, which took place in 2002, Banaz was subjected to routine beatings and violent. Banaz stated, he treated me as if I was a shoe that he could put on whenever he wanted. Because Peiman lived with Banaz at one point with the two husbands, she witnessed everything that Banaz went through. When her husband was confronted, I'm not sure by who, maybe Peiman, but confronted about the beatings and the rapes that he would commit on Banaz, he stated, yes, I do beat your daughter, but it's because she's disrespectful. And yes, I do force her to have sex, but only when she says no. He wouldn't let her use the washing machine to do their laundry. She had to do it by hand. And if she used the washing machine, she would be beat. Scratches all over her face and her teeth were even chipped from being beat so much. Banaz had told her family about what was going on in her marriage. She was really angry and she wanted a divorce. Her family was aware of the violence and of the rapes, but they told her that it was acceptable and that she had to learn to be a better wife for her husband. They felt that she had to stay in the marriage because otherwise it would bring shame to the family. But Naz had no choice, no options, and because she was so young, she stayed. And as it usually does, it only got worse, no matter what she did. In May 2005, a friend arranged a secret meeting between Bekol and Banaz. It was the first time the sisters had seen each other in three years. Bekol noticed that Banaz was visibly thinner. She had chipped teeth. She had bruises all over her body, scratches on her face. And Banaz told her sister that she was not enjoying her life, that her life just consisted of doing what her husband told her to do. A few months later, in July 2005, Benaz finally left her husband and went back to stay with her parents. They were not happy about this and divorce was not an option. Benaz was smart. She knew she was in the UK. She knew she had options. She had rights. Benaz was smart. She knew she was in the UK. She had options. She had rights. She didn't have to accept this type of treatment. So after two years of abuse, in October of 2005, she went to the police. In this interview, she talks about in heartbreaking detail everything she was enduring with her husband. She talked about how he raped and beat her. During this time, Banaz had begun secretly dating a friend of hers. He was also Iranian Kurdish and his name was Ramat Suleimani and he was 28 years old and she had chosen Ramat herself. It was her decision. It was someone that she liked. It was her choice. It, was a, it wasn't someone that her parents had chosen or her parents approved of. I believe because they were already friends, her parents had already warned off Ramat, but Ramat and Banaz, they fell in love and they did their best to hide their relationship. They would talk and text morning and night, and they knew they were gonna get in trouble 
you know, if anyone found out, but they couldn't be without each other. Eventually, her parents did find out and they were furious because Ramat wasn't immediate family. He wasn't a strict Muslim and they just did not want their daughter having anything to do with him. What Banaz didn't know is that someone from the community had seen Banaz kissing Ramat outside a train station and immediately went and told her family. It was from then on that her father Mahmoud and his brother Ari decided that Banaz had to die. Ari, even though he was the younger brother, was the head of the Mahmoud family. Apparently on 2nd December 2005, a council of war was held at her uncle Ari's house where they basically confirmed and made the decision that Banaz and Ramath would both be killed. During this meeting, Ari Mahmoud rang Banaz's mother and told her that that was going to happen. They were going to be killed. And he stated, they are bringing shame on the family and that bitch and that bastard are going to die. I believe it was when this phone call was made or it was either when Ari called her mother and told her about the plan or it was when the brother, her own brother, called his mom to let him know the exact details is when Banaz overheard the conversation. Imagine how terrified Banaz was. Just imagine hearing that and you know it's serious. Not knowing what was going to happen to her if she went into the kitchen, the bathroom, in her own home. She told Rama about the call and they then went to the police once again and wrote them a letter even stating that her life was being threatened by her family and that Kurdish men from the community were following her wherever she went. And in this letter, she even gave the police the men's names. On New Year's Eve 2005, Banaz's father takes her to her grandmother's house. He locked Banaz in the home and forced her to drink brandy. However, he would only offer her the alcohol glass while he was wearing gloves. And while he did this, he told Banaz not to look at him. Banaz sensed something was wrong and something was about to happen. She somehow got out and smashed a neighbor's window in the process and no one was home. So then she ran and ran and ran down the street and managed to get to a cafe, but she collapsed outside the cafe because she was bleeding quite badly and someone called the police. She was taken to hospital and Ramath joined her at the hospital and he takes this chilling video of her where she's just talking about the situation and she says, if I run away, I'm dead. If I go home, I'm dead. Then Banaz is interviewed by a police officer. She's saved, right? But no, because he doesn't believe her. He tells her that this plot that someone was going to kill her was all in her head and it was just a fantasy. He says that Banaz is being manipulative and melodramatic. Then he stated that the police wanted to charge her for smashing that neighbor's window. The police ignored Banaz fears for her own life. Between October 2005 and January 23rd, 2006, Banaz went to the police at least five times five times to plead for help. She told them about the threats she was receiving from her family and the community. And if you watch any of Banaz's videos or interviews, she doesn't seem like an attention-seeking person. Not that that's ever an excuse for the police not to look into, you know, your fears, but just to, you know, drive it home further, she does not seem like an attention-seeking person. She genuinely seems so timid she doesn't seem like she wants to be there and be doing this. She seems genuinely afraid. In that letter to the police that she handed in on 12th December 2005, she named all of the people that she believed were plotting against her. She told them about her father trying to kill her. She told them about her much older husband raping her and beating her. Her boyfriend Ramit had taken a video of her basically reiterating those same claims she had made in the letter. The police did not take any of her claims seriously, nor did they take any steps or any measures to protect her safety while these claims were even being investigated. I've watched the interview that Banaz gave to the police, the initial interview in 
October of 2005, and she is a smart girl. It was the police that failed her here. In this interview, she is giving detailed information about her husband's abuse. She talks about how he kicked her so hard in the head that it made her mouth and her ears bleed, that he broke her wrist, that her memory was suffering from all the hits to the head she received, that she had documented the abuse and put it all in a diary, but her husband found this diary and then destroyed it. She says, you know, in my culture, women are not allowed to call our husbands by their names. And one time she accidentally said his name in front of a guest and he threatened to stick a knife in her if she did it again. And this interview, it it really touched me and I'm not gonna go into detail, you know, too much, but you guys, most of you guys know that I'm a lawyer and you know that through the years I've had to sit in client interviews and take notes, write affidavits of victims similar to Banaz. And it's a little bit different because when I'm at the office, I have a different mindset. Like you don't show your emotions. You have to be strong and help your clients. But watching this interview from a different perspective, different mindset, I realized, wow, Banaz could have very easily been one of our clients. She is one of our clients, one of the many women and men I've encountered, you know, in my job. And this is just another story, you know, and it's like, it shouldn't be. These are real people. And that is why we tell their stories. And Every story we talk about, that should be the last one, you know? So Bernaz goes on to say that she had been noticing that a bunch of men were following her, men she had seen before in her community, men that she had recognized. And they followed her in cars, they followed her on foot. And she then says at the end of the video, she says, so, you know, that's the main reason I came to the police station so that in the future or at any time, if anything happens to me, it's them. And then she ends it by saying, now that I've given this statement, what can you do for me? What they did for her was take three months to write up her report. Within two weeks of Banaz signing this statement as a true account, she was dead. I don't understand why they didn't take her to a women's shelter that very same day. After Banaz was released from hospital following that encounter with her father, she had nowhere to go. So her parents arranged to meet with her at a McDonald's. I believe she went with Ramad and her father apologizes to her at this McDonald's and tells her that, you know, I should not have listened to my brother Ari. They promised that nothing was going to happen to her and that she should just come home. But they lied. On 22nd January 2006, an attempt to kidnap Ramad was made. Three of the men that attempted to kidnap Ramath were named in Banaz's handwritten letter. These men threatened to kill Ramath and Banaz, and on 23rd January 2006, Banaz immediately reported this to the police. Two separate statements were made, one by Ramath, one by Banaz, and Banaz was scheduled to return back to the station on 24th January 2006 to give further statements, but she never arrived. After Banaz went radio silent, Ramath reported her missing and he was extremely concerned for her welfare. Again, with this, he wasn't taken seriously at first, but after he harassed the police, the officers went to Banaz's family to talk to them. That day, Banaz was at home when her parents left to go shopping. When they left the house, they informed three of their relatives that Banaz was alone. They wanted to give the killers more space to kill Banaz. When the police interviewed Banaz's parents and her uncle Ari, they insisted that Banaz had not gone missing. They were progressive. They had embraced the westernized life and their daughters were free to come and go as they pleased. They had suggested she had simply gone to stay with a friend. And she often did this. She often spent the night you know, away. And she was not a missing person. Ramit did not believe this. He knew 
something had happened and he was insisting on finding out the answers. What he didn't know was that same day, Benaz would be forced to endure two and a half hours of torture. When her parents left the house to go shopping, her father told Muhammad Saleh Ali, Omar Hussein, and Muhammad Hama that the coast was clear. The three men then burst into the room that Benaz was sleeping on the floor. They beat and raped her before using a boot lace to strangle her to death. Benaz was only 20 years old. After she was killed, Benaz's body was stuffed into a suitcase and transported around 100 miles away to be buried in the back garden of somebody's house in Birmingham. They buried her body, which was inside the suitcase, in some dirt around the back, and it was surrounded by water pipes that had burst. You can imagine what would happen to a dead body in a suitcase in some dirt soaking in water. Police interviewed Banaz's parents and her uncle Ari once again. They searched their homes and they revealed inconsistencies with their stories. Banaz's phone and bank accounts hadn't been used since 22nd January. She was nowhere to be found and her family didn't seem to care. This led to police looking further into Banaz's life. They examined Ramit's phone, the video that he had of Banaz in the hospital and the messages that they exchanged between each other. And they found out that Mahmoud was not the sweet, loving, progressive dad that he claimed to be. They then compiled a list of suspects similar to the list that Banaz had already given them months prior. Following this, they started search teams and investigations and conducted raids all over town. Many of the people in the community would slam their doors shut on the police, refusing to share any information. I believe at this point, her father and her uncle Ari were already in police custody. But then on 6th February 2006, Muhammad Hama was arrested and charged with murder after Ramad identified him as being one of the men who tried to abduct him and threatened to kill him and Banaz. Then, while Muhammad was in custody, he was secretly recorded by the police, bragging to other inmates about what he had done to Banaz, the role he played in the murder of his cousin. I believe all of these men that killed her were related to Banaz. I'm not sure if they were actually real cousins, but they were related. And he directly implicated Ari, Muhammad Saleh Ali, Omar Hussein, and Dana Amin. So honestly, guys, this recorded conversation that Muhammad is spilling all the details is honestly sick. The way he speaks, it's sick. So I'm just going to summarize it for you guys because I can't read everything. So Basically, he was laughing and bragging about the other men involved, slapping and effing her. Muhammad himself initially says he effed her. He then says that bitch's soul was just not leaving her body. It took her over two hours to die. She was vomiting because she was so scared. They then stamped on her neck. And I'm not going to talk about her actual death description because it's just, it's too brutal. So then he says he didn't know that her younger sister was actually upstairs and that she knew what was happening downstairs to her sister, Banaz, but that Banaz's uncle, uncle Ari was a bastard for not letting him know that the younger sister was upstairs. However, what he also admitted was that Uncle Ari was supervising the entire murder of his niece. Muhammad then jokes about Banaz's hair and elbow sticking out of the suitcase when they were trying to conceal her body and how a p police patrol car drove past them dragging the suitcase along the street and 
he like almost made a run for it because he thought they were going to get caught in that moment. It's honestly horrific how casually he's talking about the murder of a completely innocent young woman. So with the recorded confession of Muhammad, phone and vehicle tracking information showing the suspects travel routes from Banaz's home to Birmingham and Rahmat's evidence that he had compiled, police found Banaz on 28th April 2006 in Handsworth, Birmingham. I believe Muhammad also made some sort of indication that her body was beneath a freezer in Birmingham and that this freezer was in a backyard. So they used a helicopter and they hovered around the general area where the phones were pinged in and they found this backyard with a freezer inside of it and they found Banaz's body in a fetal position inside the suitcase. Now, like I said before, in the condition that it was buried in, she was so badly decomposed that no DNA samples could be taken off her body. Her father, Mahmoud, and her uncle, Ari, claimed they had nothing to do with Benaz's murder, and they blamed it solely on the other men involved. In June 2007, those involved were sentenced for murder. Banaz's father and uncle Ari were found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 20 and 23 years respectively. Muhammad Hama pled guilty and was sentenced to life with a minimum of 17 years. Muhammad Saleh Ali and Omar Hussein escaped to Iraq to avoid trial. However, they were tracked down successfully and they became the first ever suspects to be successfully extradited from Iraq to the UK. They were sentenced to 21 and 22 years respectively for their involvement in the murder and they were also found guilty of plotting to kidnap and threatening to kill Rama. A couple of other men, Shwetan Hama, was convicted of conspiracy to pervert the course of justice and got time served and Dana Amin was convicted of perverting the course of justice and preventing the victim's lawful and decent burial. He was sentenced to eight years in prison. Sadly, it is thought that over 50 men and women were involved in Banaz's murder and some in the cover-up of her body, some who offered to lie for family members, refused to give information, but all of these people escaped prosecution. On 26th June 2007, a memorial was held for Banaz at the Morden Assembly Hall, following which a granite memorial headstone was placed at her gravesite and her family did not attend either service. Bacol was the first known woman in British legal history to give evidence against her own family in an honor killing trial. That is why to this day she still lives under witness protection and she has become a mother now. I hope she's with a man that treats her well, makes her happy, and hope she lives a much happier life according to her own terms. Her sister Paymon was eventually able to divorce her husband and now is a strong advocate for the rights and protection of women and children. Ramit, who had to assume a secret identity and also live under witness protection, stated that there was no life for him following Benaz's death. And in 2016, Ramit took his own life. It's obvious that the police repeatedly failed Benaz. I mean, her husband was not even found or interviewed prior to her death, despite those horrific claims she had made. I couldn't even find his name and a photo of him. Like, was his identity being protected? And I mean, I guess so, because we weren't there. We don't know for sure that these things happened. But Banaz's statements were never investigated in those four months she reported feeling unsafe. If Ramit never reported Banaz missing, would anyone even know where she was? 
I read a statement saying, police in most Western countries are ill-equipped to deal with these deep-seated practices that still take place to this day, but remain hidden within communities. Another statement I read said, the UN in 2000 estimated there were 5,000 honor-based killings worldwide, the most brutal form of censure against women who are seen to have brought shame on a family or community. While most cases are in South Asia or the Middle East and predominantly uh, from Muslim communities, cases such as that of 19-year-old Banaz Mahmud brought to light the tensions within immigrant communities struggling to adjust to changes in lifestyle. I think the problem that we can all recognize is that these victims, and they are victims before they are killed, when they are forced to dress a certain way, forbidden from certain privileges, it normally takes place within their community. These girls are not allowed to mingle outside their community. And due to this, a lot of it remains hidden. It's not easy for teachers, counselors, friends to see these practices unless it happens in front of them. Or if these girls tell them, and most of these girls are too afraid to speak out. It is hidden for a reason. If these people who enforce these traditions believe there's nothing wrong with them, why not just have it out in the open? If you're going to be arrested for practicing a mutilation on a little girl, maybe, you know, it's not the best thing. The second problem is when these practices occur, when this abuse takes place and the victim gathers the strength to ask for help and then those requests are ignored, delayed, not taken seriously enough, then what hope do they have? But Nas asked for help, not once, not twice, more than five times and nothing was done. Not even a teeny tiny phone call. Hey, are you the husband? Can you come down to the station? Nothing. Jasvinder Sangira, he's the director of Karma Nirvana, which is a group that supports honor-based violence victims. He accused police of fumbling in the dark. He stated, there is a lack of confidence amongst women that police will protect them. There is a misconception that forced marriage and honor killing is part of our culture, but these are criminal activities and they need to be treated as such. The officers who dealt with Banaz failed in their public duty to protect her. The sad thing is Banaz's story will happen again. Oh, so I'm hoping by talking about these cases, talking about these victims, more people become aware that these victims exist. More training is offered to police officers and other workers who should be equipped to help these victims. I know in my field, when we have encountered victims of abuse, we refer them on to other services that can help them, you know, safe places. And it's important to keep in touch with these services, not just send them off and let it become someone else's problem. Because if we all work together, we can save lives. Payman says of her sister Banaz, she just wanted to see people happy. She would do anything for you, even if she knew you for five minutes. I hope Banaz's voice, together with other women facing similar situations, I hope their voices can be heard. I actually had a little bit more information to discuss but I feel like I'm just gonna get really emotional and some people have commented that I'm too emotional but I can't help it like I don't know what am I supposed to do turn off my feelings it's... I thought I could talk about it more but I don't think I can but I do feel that we need to focus more on talking about these cases other women who have faced similar situations and then I've also read a couple of comments where people have said you know I don't want to hear about women and children being murdered on your channel but that's exactly the problem isn't it we don't want to hear about it we don't want to talk about it it's better for us if we don't hear about it if we don't have to deal with the emotions that come with talking about their stories i feel like sharing these stories if one of you out there you know recognizes a woman in danger just from hearing these victim stories recognizing a sign like hey you know my my friend's daughter at school said she's not allowed to sleep on a bed. You know, her brothers have a bed, but she doesn't have a bed. Maybe that would trigger something in your brain, you know, to pay more attention to that friend, notice other signs and possibly follow your gut, ask for help. What if you actually saved 
a life. And I know that example is not the best, you know, example to give, but that's all I can think of right now. But that is why these cases are so important to me. I know a lot of you guys want to hear about other cases, which I do try to do, but first and foremost, most as a wife, as a daughter, as a sister, as a friend, and most importantly, a mom. These women and children will forever be a part of my heart. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below, guys, and I will see you in next week's video. Besitos. Bye.